thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'm Michael Lind. Uh, at home, uh, my colleagues actually, they gave me a t-shirt uh, where it says, I love ports. So, uh, I have been uh, for a long time very, very interested in port operations and uh, what conditions really drives the port conditions. And uh, of course, uh, a port would not exist without a a, um, a, uh, a shipping line coming out and into the port, but it would not exist either if there were no things to transport. So for me, uh, it is very <coughs> clear now that we have a situation where we need to integrate uh, what is happening at sea and what is happening at ports. Uh, and there are different providers, there are different concepts coming forward in trying to enable that. One of those is sea traffic management, and sea traffic management validation project, Mona Lisa projects, has been coined as, I think, the largest e-navigation project in the world. I'm a little bit unfortunate that it is called e-navigation, because I think it concerns also what happens in, in ports. In any case, uh, we have a situation where we have desires from uh, shipping companies. They want to experience reduced total turnaround times. The largest shipping companies are saying and going out, they're doing 40,000 port costs per year. Out of the 20 million port costs per year that we're making, they're going out and saying, we would like to reduce our total turnaround time around 45 to 2 hours, 45 minutes to 2 hours. That puts an enormous pressure on the ports. It is not okay any longer to sit down and say that, okay, you have a slot time of 8 hours, and then we see how long you use that, use that, use that both. They want to stay bunker, they want to and as we hear here, uh, they want to optimally uh, utilize the fleet. They want to reduce anchoring time. But we have also other actors. We have terminals. They want to increase their birth productivity, the capacity utilization, and do more informed birth planning. So we elaborated and brought forward a concept called Port CDM, Port Collaborative Decision Making, uh, which is a concept uh, that is uh, bound to the sea traffic management fam family. Uh, and it has also been very inspired from the airport CDM, uh, which we have been doing here in Europe. Where, and you know, when we, when we take off a flight in Europe, it's not possible to uh, leave the airport before you have a slow time on the other end. Uh, and I tried to do that in the maritime sector, I was kicked out immediately because uh, <laughs> flights, can anchor, flights cannot anchor, but boats can anchor. Anyway, uh, it's very much about data sharing. And I fully agree with the previous speaker that we, we need to come to a situation where we can predict uh, very much of what is going to happen, or forecast what is going to happen in the future. So, um, the Port CDM concept is relying on trying to withdraw enough data to be able to say something about future operations, whether they will be in time or not. Um, and that in turn will lead to, uh, lead to possibilities for green steaming, minimal waiting times, just-in-time operations, fast turnaround, etc. Uh, from a shipping point of view, when you're out at sea, of course the port is a hub. That's a, a, an actor. But when you uh, open up that box, you see that there's a lot of actors that are communicating and doing things together. And the first time I came to a port, I was asking the people at the port, when, what time is that ship going to leave? And I asked five people and I got five different <coughs> answers. So, very many times they are not aligned. We are talking about 6,000 ports in the world, uh, 3,900 that is more active. So, <coughs> my strong belief and uh, what we are elaborating on now in, in our testbed with 13 ports in Europe is that there is a need for both connected ships and connected ports in order to uh, experience what we say port call optimization, voyage optimization and port call synchronization. Port call optimization concerns that the ship is in an optimized way served when it is in the port. Port call synchronization concerns uh, arriving and departing uh, just in time. Um, but this has also meant that we have started to stress the issue of port-to-port -port collaboration because there's a lot of things that can be revealed, especially in short sea shipping, that can be revealed by knowing things what is happening in the previous port. Uh, and that is, not some, that is something that it can usually not be revealed from the ship if you do not really try, uh, trust the captain, that the captain is, is uh, providing that information into the AS or uh, through a voyage plan, etc., etc. 
Um, up in Sweden, we have a, a port called Brofjorden that we have connected, and we have a port called Gothenburg, and that's a lot of ships going between those two ports. And uh, it turned out, when we implemented Port CDM in both these ports, it turned out that they lot of, knew a lot of things in Brofjorden uh, about the ship's arrival, but the plans were not updated in Port of Gothenburg. So they actually re uh, reserved capacity in Gothenburg for a ship that was going to come 12 hours later, and they already knew it in, 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 uh, in Port of Brofjorden. This is the strong enabler to coming into the uh, enabling the connectivity to interland operations. We do have in Europe uh, a large uh, movement, um, it's called the Digital Transport Logistic Forum, where we are doing corridor management um, uh, and trying to find digital infrastructures where you actually would apply the same type of thinking with connected devices, um, information services providing data for the whole transport chain. And I think that we have a golden opportunity to bring maritime transports into this larger transportation system. So, just shortly, um, the, the, um, um, if you look into Port CDM in an, in an uh, SDM context, you will see that what we are pushing here is uh, concepts of voyage management, and that is uh, primarily concerned with a uh, high degree of interoperability empowered by RTZ as the IEC, uh, the route exchange format, where voyage plans are being um, shared ship to ship, ship to shore, and enabling new services coming forward. For example, there are, are voyage plans um, uh, with uh, one of our partners, Transas, but what we're doing is, is to sharing the voyage plans directly from the active system directly to the shore, as, as one example. We have flow management, which is very much about, uh, and our focus is, is uh, uh, very much on, on how the, the shore centers or the vessel traffic uh, services are working, and the more authority driven, how uh, we can synchronize and, and, uh, and uh, optimize uh, our monitoring. And then we have port collaborative decision making as a port call optimization and synchronization tool. And, uh, uh, I am the, the activity leader for that and, and running these 13 test bells in Europe. And uh, just, just to see here, we have a number of different business incentives. Uh, and as I said before, uh, just uh, the savings for a large shipping line uh, is, is uh, enormous. Uh, we can see an uh, uh, annual savings by reduced total turnaround time by minutes uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, related to, to terminal operations. We see that captains really want to get out of port. Uh, this, uh, this whole stress situation about chasing and also speeding up to, to meet the next birth window. And also we have made investigations where we see that if you reduce about 17% of the total turnaround time, you can take away one vessel uh, given a business case of five legs, five ships uh, using four ports. And it is estimated that 25% of all port operations uh, is, is uh, waste time. Okay, we have a, uh, so what we, what we need is uh, just-in-time arrival, green steaming, just-in-time departures, and reduced chasing, and reduced total turnaround time. It's, it's pretty simple. But we have a situation where we cannot rely just on the ship. We need to start thinking about the actors that are in, in the port. The challenge then is that every port in the world has its own unique mosaic of IT systems. So I would, it would be fully, totally um, naive to stand up here and say that, okay, we have a situation where we change all the port systems. That would never happen. So how do we come about that situation? Uh, what we have tried to do, and we are pushing it, and, and uh, I fully agree with the previous speakers that pushing a process of standardization will take us 10 years, and that means that the whole market has, uh, has, is gone, or, or uh, the, whole, uh, the whole opportunity of digitalization is, is uh, moved out. So. So we introduced a concept that we call emerging standardization, meaning that what we want to do is enough actors that comes to an agreement of how we should share data, which kind of formats, and, and what it means to be compliant. Every port I come to, they say to me, Michael, is this a home invention, or is it something that is uh, internationally accepted? When you come for a message format, for example. Okay, I realize that, that, that this will take time. But on the other hand, if we can prove and provide some value and some, some really good stakeholder buy in, then we might come to a situation where we actually are having a more standardized situation. 
What we did was that we brought forward something called a Port City Amp Council or an international Port City Amp Council that is catering for a, a, the message standards and, and uh, what, what it needs to be Port City Amp compliance so that you as a shipping line, and that, this was, a, this was a, a question from the shipping line saying that we want to know what we can expect from that port that we are, um, uh, that we are going towards. Um, what uh, what no. they did, or, uh, or the Port City Amp Council did, was that they said that the, the oh. findings here with the port call message format is so good, so let us make that to an IALA as to XX standard. Uh, follow the DMDS, uh, DMDS registry. That is, uh, is in turn uh, making the, both the providers and the users of uh, Port CDM feeling more comfortable in that situation. And suddenly we have a minimalistic message format that we can utilize in our uh, big data, but contextualized in relation to the, this kind of situation. So what I do is that I run uh, and provide tools uh, in our testbed now for uh, enhanced situation awareness where we are combining data from ports in the port to port, data from ships um, about ship movements and data from port, port call operations. And in this way you suddenly can start to predict when things are going to happen. So one of my applications now is is uh, that uh, if we see that a ship is delayed to the pilot boarding station, given the histo history in that port, can we say something about what time it will lead from the birth? And that's, that's kind of interesting, what you can do with very big, big, big data analytics. I mean, I took, uh, took uh, 10,000 port calls in Port of Gothenburg and we got out, uh, got out uh, figures on on-time probability based on that. That's one part of it. The other part is that we need also trans to transform the maritime sector to not just rely on statement of facts, meaning uh, to report what has actually happened. We need also to push that actors start to share their intentions. And that's enormously important because if you share your intention, you might be able to optimize and replan in another way. So, given this, uh, hopefully we can come to a situation. It does not matter if we are in a situation where port of, of, uh, of uh, let's say Rotterdam or port of Umeå or port of Vasa, if they are doing and inventing their own thing, we will not come to a more efficient, you talk global ecosystem, the ecosystem is self-organized, it consists of autonomous actors, etc., etc. We need to reach some degree of compliance and invite all the service providers that are out there to actually start making interfacing and, 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 and communicate with each other in a standardized way. In this way, we would both reach vertical compliance. There are system providers that are uh, providing systems to different ports. Let's take Navis, for example, the largest terminal operating system provider. They have 500 ports, so 500 terminals in the repertoire of, 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 uh, of the customers. Okay, if they could provide one single interface to all these uh, terminals uh, from, to uh, from the, all these terminals, you would have a much better situation. And we need to reach horizontal, horizontal compliance levels between ports, port to port, and ship to port, and also port to hinterland. That's me.